Friday afternoon with you and answering some of your most pressing voiceover business and marketing questions, whatever it is that, that you want to talk about, questions that you want to get answered, things that are weighing on your mind. I am here and, and ready to answer those questions for you and looking forward to spending a little bit of time with you this afternoon doing that. Off the top, I wanted to talk about something that has come up a couple of times this week in coaching sessions, and then I had the opportunity of having a, a lengthy discussion on the subject with uh, a podcast guest for an interview that I'm going to be recording coming up here in uh, October. I've actually recorded the interview. The episode is is going to be coming up in October, um, but it's it's. I guess we'll we'll narrow it down to content creation. Maybe that doesn't really narrow it down, but there's a misconception that exists in the voiceover community that if you want to use content for marketing. So let's define content, a post that you share to LinkedIn, a video that goes on TikTok, a reel that you are creating for Instagram, a YouTube channel that you're thinking about starting, a podcast that you might be hosting, or a blog that you might be writing. Content, the, the overarching theme of content. The idea is that if you're going to create this content, that it has to be about voiceover. And so then where the hangup comes for a lot of voice actors is, what do I talk about? What do I talk about? Because everybody's already talking about voiceover, uh, so I don't want to say all the same things. Or what do I talk about? Because I'm not a coach. I don't offer coaching services. I don't consider myself to be an expert. I don't know that I have any value to add. You know, I don't want to share voiceover tips. This is where I think the disconnect comes. Part of your marketing strategy, of course, is going to be talking about your voiceover business, talking about your voiceover services, talking about the things that you can do for your clients, talking about the ways that you can add value, talking about the, the specific service offerings that you have, talking about how you're going to make their life easier, how you can solve a problem for them, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. That is obviously going to be part of what you are going to do with your content, but that doesn't need to be your exclusive content strategy. And so that's one of the things that I, I, I've been talking a lot about with voice actors. And uh, in, a, in a podcast interview, I recorded a, a podcast interview with Hunter Peterson yesterday. And we're going to be talking about YouTube. Some really, really great discussion and some great strategies for, for YouTube and, and ways that you could potentially set up a YouTube channel. And Part of what we talked about in that interview was inspired partially by what I talked about a couple of times in coaching sessions earlier this week. And so one of the examples that I want to give, there was a, a particular talent that I had a conversation with, and there's a passion, there's a subject that they are passionate about, and they were trying to figure out how they incorporate this subject that they're passionate about into their voiceover marketing. And my point to them was, why do you have to explicitly merge those two things together. Could you not just create content around that particular subject that you are passionate about? And my advice to this individual was, I think that you could create a podcast around this subject that you are passionate about. And I think that in doing that podcast and targeting that audience and adding value to that audience, I think that there is the potential for that to become a marketing driver for your voiceover business, even though you're not explicitly talking about voiceover. The content itself has nothing to do with voiceover. Uh, so example, you love shoes. You're a passionate shoe collector. You, you've got all the Jordans. You, you travel the world in search of, of shoes and trying to find the right shoes, the collectible shoes, the, the particular ones that are going to finish out your collection, whatever. This is a passion project of yours. You could build an entire content machine around that passion project, and it could be in the form of a podcast, it could be in the form of a YouTube channel, it could be in the form of TikTok videos, it could be in the form of Instagram reels. You could build an entire content machine around your passion for shoes that could ultimately open up voiceover opportunities for you because, let's be honest here, people who use voiceover probably wear shoes. And so chances are, if you're reaching enough people in an audience, 
there's going to be a percentage of that audience who could be decision makers for voiceover in whatever it is that that they do. Uh, you know, the, the best example of this is Stefan Johnson in the way that Stefan Johnson has been able to leverage his TikTok, 10 million viewers or 10 million subscribers, probably more than that actually now, uh, but 10 million subscribers on TikTok doing food reviews and talking about snacks but that has exploded his voiceover business because people hear him every day. They get to know him. They be, he becomes a part of their, their life, but they hear his voice. And when they hear his voice, they're like, man, I want that guy to do this voice for me. I want that guy to voice this thing for me. And it's opened up incredible doors and incredible opportunities. And so the whole premise of this, don't exclusively put yourself inside the voiceover box. Don't assume that in order for social media or a content strategy to be effective or to uh, result in potential voiceover opportunities for your business, don't assume that that means that you can only talk about voiceover. There might be ways that you can leverage other passions, skills, interests, hobbies, etc., and turn those into a marketing strategy for you and your voiceover business. So that's what I wanted to touch on uh, because it's come up a bunch and I'm, I'm really looking forward to the interview with, with Hunter Peterson. Again, that interview is actually gonna be coming out early in October. Uh, speaking of the podcast though, let's take a look at uh, some of what's coming up here. Uh, Celia Siegel is gonna be on the show September 7th. We're gonna be talking all about branding, which is gonna be really great. Uh, John Ferreira, I was able to land an interview with the CEO of Nimble. We're gonna be doing a lot of talk about CRM and how CRM can benefit you as a, as a VOpreneur, as a solopreneur. Uh, we'll also be talking uh, about Nimble and, and about some of the things that are coming to Nimble, some things that are in the pipeline. Uh, on September 21st, Everett Oliver is going to be on the show. And I put Everett Speaks His Truth. For those of you that are familiar with Everett, I have no idea what I'm going to do in my interview with Everett Oliver at this point. Um, because it's really hard to get Everett into a box. It's really hard to say, uh, Everett, I want to talk to you about commercial or Everett, I want to talk to you about animation. Uh, because once you give Everett the opportunity to talk, he's just going to speak his truth. That's what Everett does, which is one of the reasons why we, we love Everett. Uh, and so that's going to be a really fun episode that, like I said, I have no idea what direction that one's going to go. And Aya from Celia Siegel Management, uh, she's going to be on the show at the end of September talking about political VO. Uh, something tells me Maybe this is a wild guess, but something tells me that there's going to be an opportunity uh, to make ungodly sums of money uh, in political voiceover uh, in, in the next year. Uh, there, there's some things going on in the, in the States. Maybe you're familiar with them. Uh, I, I feel like there's going to be a lot of money spent in political. Uh, so I think that's going to be a really good episode. Uh, really looking forward to learning some things. And I is doing some incredible things, uh, very well versed in the political landscape. And so looking forward to hearing her take and, and looking forward to seeing uh, what kind of information she has to share with uh, with everyday VOpreneurs like you and me who may be interested in uh, expanding into the political space for voiceover. So again, welcome to Free Advice Friday. If you do have a question that you would like to ask and get answered, you can type that question into the comments. Just put a Q beside it. Uh, I'm keeping an eye out in the chat for your questions, and I am happy to answer any questions that you may have. So uh, that's the way that works. Don't be shy. Anything business and marketing related, I am happy to uh, have a conversation with you about. So again, just uh, put a Q beside it when you're putting it into the comments, and I will keep an eye out for it. Stevie's kicking us off this week. What information should I have on a business card? A uh, good value place to print from. I think I need to see your contact information first and foremost, right? I need to know your name. I need to know that you're a voice actor. It needs to be abundantly clear that you're a voice actor. A lot of voice actors, they, they'll come up with these really fun and, and creative names for their business. And it's okay to have a fun and creative name for your business, but it needs to speak to voiceover. Somehow, I need to be able to make the connection that you are a voice actor unless in addition to the name of your business, you express it in your tagline or something else. So if I'm looking at your business card, I need to be able to discern very quickly that you are a voice actor. And having a microphone on your business card does not immediately lend itself to voice actor. So somewhere on there, your name, very clear that you are a voice actor. I, I wanna see your phone number. I wanna see your website. I wanna see your email address. And I think that it's really important to leave some white space on a business card. Because if you are handing those out at networking events, for example, 
somebody might want to be able to write a little quick note on there about where they met you, how they met you, what you talked about, um, whatever. And so I think that there's there's definitely uh, value in in leaving a little bit of white space and something else that I think is is worth it. Uh, and I know that there's you know differing opinions on this, but I think it's worth it to have a QR code. I think that putting a QR code that goes straight to your website or to a particular website, uh, I think that that means uh, I think that that makes it easier for somebody to to get there. Uh, that that removes the barriers of access, and so. Uh, having a QR code that directs them to a, uh, whether it's just your homepage or, or a particular landing page, uh, I definitely think there's there's value there. So those are some of the things that I would be taking into consideration. I think you got to be very careful with your fonts. I think you've got to be very careful with your colors. I think um, sometimes we try, we try to get too fancy. Uh, it's it's uh, form over function, but we want it the opposite. I think we want function over form uh, in this case. It is more important to me that your business card gives me the information that I need than it is that your business card looks super fancy and pretty. That is not to say don't take design into consideration. Of course, take design into consideration. But if you've got very fancy scripted fonts um, that are that are difficult to read, or if you're using the wrong colors over top of each other, again, making it difficult to read, those are things that need to be taken into consideration. If you're trying to cram too much stuff onto the business card, there's too much information there. Um, that's something else that that can take away. And so those are the things that I want to be taking into consideration from a design standpoint. What else do you guys want to talk about today? What, what other questions can I answer for you? How can uh, I be of service and assistance on, on this free Advice Friday? Uh, looking forward to answering your voiceover business and marketing questions. I see that uh, Threads continues to make updates to the platform, new features being added all the time. There's search functionality that has been built into it now, uh, web-based uh, functionality that is being built into it now, and yet it still feels to me like nobody's using it. I mean, I, I, I check it. I do not check it as much as I check Twitter, X. Uh, I check that. You know, I check. I'm on X multiple times throughout the day. Threads, you know, maybe I check once a day or a couple times a week or whatever, just to see if there's anything happening there yet. Doesn't really appear like there's a whole lot going on. Uh, that doesn't mean the platform's going away. Uh, maybe there's something to be said for being an early adopter. Uh, I think you know Zuck's got enough money that he can afford to throw money at it for a little bit longer to see whether or not it's it's going to stick. But any of you guys using it? Have you have you had any positive interactions? on threads yet? Are you following anybody that you're learning from? Or have you connected with any clients or potential clients or leads or anything like that? I'm, I'm very curious if uh, if anybody has any, any stories about threads, but I do continue to keep up with it. Read what's going on, see about new features that are being added. I, uh, you know, I, I think it was the shiny new thing, you know, like 100 million people signed up for it almost instantly. And now there's like, 10, I don't know, 10 million people or something like that that are using it actively, like it, it dropped off there pretty quick. But Still a social media platform, which is uh, worth paying a little bit of attention to because who's to say where it's going to go? Sean says, sorry, I'm late. Just finished my demo session with Cliff. Well, I bet you that was a fun session. Cliff Zellman is amazing. Absolutely brilliant demo producer. One of the best. Uh, king of automotive, of course. I've had the privilege of having Cliff come on Free Advice Friday and also on the podcast as well. And he's always got a ton of information to share. That is one of the things that I appreciate about Cliff is he holds nothing back. He, he gives away all the keys to the kingdom uh, when he's on the show and, and gives you all the information that you possibly could ever want to know. Why do so many people in VO recommend the Rode NT1 as a starter mic instead of a dynamic mic that might not pick up ambient noise in a starter studio? Ah, this sounds like a question that Uncle Roy should probably answer. Um, there is definitely something to be said for the sound quality of the dynamic microphones, the pickup patterns and all of that sort of stuff. Um, I'm not, I am not a tech guy, so uh, I'm not going to attempt to answer that question from a technical standpoint. Uh, but there is definitely, um, there's, there's gain issues that often happen. Like, uh, I, you know, when I first started recording, I used an EVRE 20, which is a dynamic microphone and I got it because I didn't know any better at the time. This is, you know, going back, I don't know, almost 20 years now. Oh my gosh, I'm old. Um, but it, I didn't know any better at the time. That's what I used in radio. So that's what I figured I would use for, for voiceover. Uh, I definitely had a lot of gain issues. Uh, the output wasn't wasn't great on it, um, and so that was one of the things that that was a was a factor. Um, 
Oh, there you go. Uncle Roy says people recommend the NT1 because it's great. If Uncle Roy says it's great, then it's great. There you go. And it's not crazy expensive. Um, and so I think that's probably one of the other advantages to it is, you know, if you're looking for a if you're looking for a, a affordable microphone from a from a startup standpoint, then, uh, you know, the the NT1, the Rode NT1 is is good. You know, people ask me about this. This is the the Rode. Uh, what is I don't even know. The Procaster Rode Procaster. Um, this is not my voiceover microphone, just to be clear. Um, I'm just sitting in my office area right now. Uh, this microphone is strictly for live streaming. It's what I use for my Zoom meetings, um, connected to a, a, a Rode, uh, Rodecaster Pro 2. Um, my studio is actually over there. My, my booth is over there. And I've got a 416 and a U87 in the booth over there. But uh, yeah, this is, not the, this is not the voiceover microphone, just, just to be clear. If you do have studio questions, I would say uh, reach out to Uncle Roy. Uncle Roy is my tech and studio guru. Uh, anytime that I have anything that I need to figure out from a sound standpoint, so microphones, interfaces, acoustics, um, my editing software, Adobe Audition, all of that sort of stuff, uh, Uncle Roy is, is my guru. The fifth generation NT1, Uncle Roy says, the fifth generation NT1. Is that the one, I, I, somebody was asking me about this the other day and I couldn't remember whether it was the NT1 or the NT1A. The fifth generation NT1, is that the, the one that's um, XLR and USB? It can, it can do either or, and it's got like some great restorative capacity. I don't know, it's got like fancy features and stuff built into it. Is, am I correct on that? I, I don't remember. Uncle Roy says everyone's setup is different. 95% use a condenser mic. So there you go. Uh, that is that is generally the, the more accepted microphone. Um, and I've actually had, if you go back through my YouTube channel, uh, you'll see where I've had Uncle Roy uh, both on, he's been on Free Advice Friday, he's been on the podcast, and we've done a webinar together, a Home Studio Basics webinar uh, together. And so all of those are available in the archives if you go back through the YouTube channel as well and, and you can look up any of those. Um, let's let's do it just for fun, shall we? Let's uh, let's pull this up. And if we go to my channel here uh, and we go down to Free Advice Friday, there's a there's a playlist here for Free Advice Friday. Um, it was a while ago when Uncle Roy, oh, there he is right there. Home studio Q and A with Uncle Roy. You know what? Let me copy this. Uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna copy this link right here, um, and I'm gonna throw it into the chat. Uh, Uncle Roy on free advice Friday. And uh, the reason why you might want to go back and check that is I do add chapter markers when uh, when people are on the on the show. I do add chapter markers, and that gives them the ability to, uh, you know, if you've got a specific, it, it'll take you to specific parts of the show where specific questions were asked and answered. Um, home Studio Basics. Uh, oops, I wanted to search my channel. Studio Basics with Uncle Roy. I did a webinar. We we did a, a webinar. There it is. There's the Home Studio Basics webinar. So uh, let me grab this one. I'm going to throw this into the chat as well. Home Studio Basics webinar. That's with Uncle Roy. Uh, so there you go. That one's in the chat as well. Uh, if you want to, if you want to check that out. Uh, again, we we you know just a bunch of questions that were asked and answered in there. Um, we talked about microphones. We talked about mic placement. We talked about audio editing and software and studio setup and all kinds of stuff. So if you've got any questions related to any of that stuff. Uh, check out some of those links that are in the chat there, and those will be uh, particularly helpful to you. Again, welcome to Free Advice Friday. If you do have a question that you would like to ask and get answered, uh, I am here to answer all of your voiceover business and marketing questions as best as I can. Uh, there you go. Uh, Guerrero says, I have the NT1 kit, fourth generation. There you go. So you're you're good. The, the, N, the, the fifth generation is just a little new and a little fancy. That's all. Uh, it's got a couple a couple extra bells and whistles. That's what they do. That's how they get you, right? Every year they introduce a new microphone that's got a couple of extra bells and whistles and then you got FOMO like you you know you're missing out cuz you don't have the the latest and greatest tech or or whatever. I was watching a watching a video yesterday of a, a YouTube live streamer. I I'm always watching videos about YouTube live streams looking at, you know, what kind of equipment are people using 
trying to figure out ways, you know, are there little things that I can do that can improve the free advice Friday live stream or some of the other stuff that I do on YouTube. And uh, this one guy, he's got a, like one of those big Husky toolboxes that you would buy from, from Home Depot, like the rolling tool, toolboxes, tool chest, I guess it is. He's got like four of those in his, in his studio. And a couple of the drawers are just filled with microphones. The guy's got like, I don't know, 30 microphones. And, and it's just because, you know, every year a new microphone comes out that's a little nicer, a little fancier, looks a little cooler, it's a different color or whatever. And, and so he's like hoarding all of these microphones. You can only use one at a time, right? You can only use one at a time. But uh, I know I know it's it's easy to get that FOMO and, and want to have all the, the shiny new equipment. But I'm, I'm sure you're okay with the uh, with the NT1 kit. Stevie Daniel says, how are you feeling about the Red Sox? Uh, next question. What else can we talk about on Free Advice Friday? Um, I will be honest with you. I knew before the season even started uh, that it was not going to be a fun year to be a Red Sox fan. Um, they had a lot of issues in the roster. They did nothing to address them. Um, the Red Sox are playing Moneyball now, um, but apparently they're not playing it well. Uh, although, I mean, I, I, at the same time, it, you have to acknowledge that even with their record, they're, you know, uh, second to last in the, in the AL East, I think they would actually be first. They'd be the first place team if they were in the MLB, uh, or the AL central, uh, division. So, you know, you got to take that into consideration, but I knew it was going to be a tough year to be a Red Sox fan. They have not given me much to be excited about. Uh, and so, uh, honestly, uh, you know, I've, I've, I've followed along throughout the season, but I, I didn't pay for my MLB subscription this year. So I haven't been able to watch a lot of games. Um, that's a whole other issue a whole other topic uh the mlb subscription i hate that there's 400 different streaming services out there now and, and the idea behind the mlb at bat was that you bought one package and you got access to all the games but as mlb continues to license out games to youtube or apple tv or this service or that service now i'm paying even more money for my mlb subscription but i get access to significantly fewer games because they keep giving all the rights away so this year i was like screw it not doing it, not doing it, done with it. So I've just been following along through, you know, Twitter and articles and every once in a while when there's a game on regular broadcast cable, I did get to go see the Red Sox. They were in Toronto. Uh, so I took my family and we went and saw the Blue Jays and, and the Red Sox uh, earlier in the season, uh, which was fun. And actually the Red Sox are, are in town. Um, well, in town, they're in Toronto uh, in a couple of weeks, uh, the weekend of my birthday, actually. Uh, so I might go and see one more game just, just to get to see them again. But yeah, I knew it was going to be a bad season. What are your top three favorite cities to visit in the United States? Well, I, I can tell you that I haven't been to a lot of, I've been to several cities multiple times, um, because of coming for conferences and things of that nature, but I haven't been to a ton of places uh, in the United States. I do love Vegas, but not for the reasons that you would probably think. Uh, I am not a gambler. Uh, so, you know, I, I go to Vegas, um, but I, you know, usually I have like a hundred dollar spending limit at the casino. Uh, and the last couple times I've come to Vegas, I have actually come out ahead by like, you know, like I came in with a hundred and walked out with three or something, 300. Um, I love Vegas because it's a great food town. There's, there's so many cool restaurants to go to. Uh, I love Vegas just because, you know, there's something to be said for walking the strip, uh, walking through all of the the different casinos, um, you know, seeing all the shops and all that sort of stuff is really fun. Um, but anytime that I've gone to Vegas, I've always rented a car and, you know, I, I would much rather spend a day going out to the Red Rock Canyon or driving out to Hoover Dam or, or some of those places that are, you know, just half an hour outside of the city that that a lot of people don't go to because they just come and go to the strip. Uh, so anytime that WoVoCon was going on in Vegas, it was always a, a, an opportunity to book a little bit of an extended visit, you know, do the conference on the weekend, but have a, a couple days on either side of the trip uh, in order to be able to go out and explore some of what Vegas had to offer. Love Cirque du Soleil. You know, any anytime I'd have an opportunity to go to Vegas and see a Cirque du Soleil show, I would I would love to go and and see a Cirque du Soleil show. So that's that's always fun. Um, DC is cool. Uh, if you're, you know, if you're a history guy or, you know, if you're into any of that sort of stuff, I'm not a political guy. Um, definitely more of a history guy than a political guy. Uh, I felt all the feels when, when I stood beside Lincoln, uh, you know, it, there's just something about being there and, and being in the presence of, of that. And, 
you know, it's still cool to walk by the White House, uh, you know, regardless of how you feel about whoever happens to be sitting in the in the in the building at the time. Uh, it's still cool to walk by. There's a lot of good seafood uh, in that area as well. And I love Boston. I mean, obviously, I love Boston. Uh, my, my goal is to eat every lobster roll in Boston. Uh, so uh, and and do it while I'm sitting at the park watching a Red Sox game. All right. Iris says, Mark, how many emails did you send out before you landed your first client? Oh, I honestly can't answer that question uh, because it was a long time ago. Um, when I was first getting started in voiceover, uh, I it was it was during what I call the glory days of online casting. And so at, at that point in time, this is this is going back to like. 2009, eight, eight, nine, ten maybe somewhere, somewhere in around there. Um, and it was still possible to make good money. Like lots of people could make good money on online casting at that point. And so that was where I was really focusing a lot of my efforts. Um, at the time I was working in radio full time. And, and so I would, you know, submit some auditions before I went into the studio in the afternoon and then uh, maybe submit some auditions when I came home from the radio station in the evening. And, and that was where I first started, uh, making money in voiceover and then just realizing that, Hey, I've got communication capabilities with a lot of these clients. At that point, you weren't restricted from stuff like that on some of the platforms. And so I could reach out to them. And so I, I started getting the idea of, you know, maybe I should check in with these people every once in a while. And, and maybe I can, you know, t turn that into some repeat work opportunities. Um, I want to say around 2000, uh, 2011, 2012, which is the, the, when I was transitioning into voiceover full time, that was when I realized that there were shifts happening on online casting. Uh, one of the particular sites, VDC, uh, I can't even say their name out loud. Um, they, they made some big rules changes on the platform, which were very detrimental to a lot of talent. And I decided that I was walking away. Actually, I got kicked off of that platform. I was going to walk away anyway, but they kicked me off for that's a whole other story for another day. Uh, so at that point, I had I still had uh, Voice One Two Three, and I had Bedalgo, um, but I wasn't seeing the number of opportunities that I had seen in the past. I wasn't booking as much as I had booked in the past. I had more and more of my auditions that were going unlistened to, which was also a problem for me. And so I was like, at that point, I'm like, if if I want to continue to grow my business, sustain my business, grow my business. Um, I got to come up with another plan. And so that was when I, I decided that I needed to try to figure out how to reach out to more of these companies directly. And that's when I started doing email marketing. Now, I will tell you that in the beginning, I was horrible at it, like just total crap. I had no idea what I was doing, but I was trying. And so I just started sending emails. I started sending a lot of emails. And when I started getting some responses from some people, I, I was just trying to pay attention to, okay, these people responded, these people didn't. What's the difference? Um, is it who I reached out to? Is it the person that I connected with? Is it what I said in the email? Is it the day of the week? You know, are there consistencies between the day of the week? Are there consistencies between the times that the emails were sent? I started looking at some of that stuff, and that's where I started figuring out that there, you know, there, there's a little bit of, I don't know, science maybe to to some of this, that there's a little bit of a formula uh, that you can work out. And so I started doing that. But I can't tell you expressly how long it took, because here's the thing, even to this day, you can reach out to the exact right person on the exact right day and book. There are those unicorns out there. They do happen. I've had it happen where I've reached out to a new contact and booked a job in the first week. It's very few and far between, but I have had that happen. And so it is a possibility, but at the same time, I've had people that I've pursued for two or three years from the first email to the first booking. And so you never know when somebody's going to need you. You never know how often somebody's creating new content. You know, one production company, they might do a dozen videos a month, um, but another production company might only do a dozen videos a year. And, and it's hard for you to know that, which is why a lot of this just has to do with scale right? The more people that you can reach out to consist on a consistent basis, the more you're going to improve the likelihood that you're going to turn it into a booking. 
And so that's kind of what I am focused on. I'm just, it, it was always like, okay, send more emails, send more emails, send more emails, right? Now I'm in a place where I don't have to send as many emails, which is nice, but I'm still putting new people in the pipeline or doing my best to put new people into the pipeline uh, every single week. And, and so that part of it never actually stops. Stevie says voiceover requires constantly altering, manipulating one's emotional state to effectively emote. Can this impact one's mental health negatively in real life, fall into a trap of playing a character? I suppose. I suppose that it could, but I think that probably depends more on the type of character that you're playing and and how deeply that you need to get into that character. Um, probably not going to happen in commercial might happen if you had a recurring role in an animated series or a recurring role in a in a in a major video game or something like that possibly if you were you know doing a series for audiobooks or something like that where you you get a little bit more immersed in a character um i've never heard of it happening that doesn't mean that it can't that doesn't mean that it hasn't i just it's not something that i've heard of um because there's not a whole lot of that going on in corporate non-broadcast voiceover which is where i spend the bulk of my time um, but it's true that, you know, you, you do have to act. You do have to have the ability to act. And the better actor that you are, the more likely that you're going to book. Again, welcome to Free Advice Friday. Thanks for hanging out today. As always, I appreciate you guys coming and giving me a little bit of your time. Uh, I'm certainly happy to answer as uh, many of your business and marketing related questions as you've got as it, as it pertains to voiceover. Uh, so if you do have a question, do me a favor, and when you are typing out your question into the comments, could you just put a Q beside it? And it makes it a little bit easier for me to spot that question, and, and I can bring it up on the screen here. And uh, whatever you want to know, business and marketing related, uh, I can't always promise it's going to be a good answer, but I can promise that I'll certainly try to, to give you an answer. And by the way, if you've been enjoying the, the live stream up to this point, would you do me a favor and hit that like button? Uh, make sure you subscribe to the channel as well so that you get notified whenever I am going live for Free Advice Friday. I uh, do want to remind you we're, we're getting closer. VoiceOver Marketing Playbook is coming back September 12th through the 21st at voiceovermarketingplaybook.com. Uh, my virtual assistant is working on a new lead list right now. So here's a little piece of insider information for you. Uh, if you are thinking about signing up for VoiceOver Marketing Playbook, sign up on day one and you are going to get leads. So my virtual assistant is building out a brand new lead list for me. He's been working on it for about two weeks now. Sign up for Playbook Basic, I'm gonna send you 100 leads. Sign up for Playbook Plus, I'm gonna send you 200 leads. Sign up for Playbook Complete, I'm gonna send you 400 voiceover leads. And these are gonna be spread across commercial explainer, e-learning, corporate, I think there might be some gaming and animation ones mixed in there as well. We'll we'll see what what uh, my virtual assistant comes up with. But it's a new list. Like, it's not even built yet. Uh, so I haven't seen it. I haven't contacted any of them. These are new leads. I know that's one of the questions that I get asked because I give away leads with, with every playbook release. Uh, do I just give away the same list over and over and over and over again? Uh, and actually, no, I don't. I, I always have my freelancer out there looking for new leads and building out new lists. So that's the deal. Uh, sign up for playbook on day one, which is going to be September 12th. If you get in on day one, uh, you will get access to that lead list. And so that is going to help you uh, in addition to uh, everything that you learn in the course, obviously, when it comes to guiding you on your marketing journey. So that's what is up with voiceover marketing playbook. Um, Let's talk about the new episode of the podcast, which is available right now. It's on the YouTube channel. You can watch the video if you want to see the uh, watch the interview, or you can listen to it wherever fine podcasts are given away for free. Stephen Blair wanted to ask me about the books that I read. Uh, I talk often about reading. Uh, I love reading. I'm constantly reading. And he wanted to know where I find my books, how I choose, what I'm going to read. Is there a you know, a list that I'm working off of or whatever. And so we talked about all of that. And I give a ton of really great book recommendations for you uh, in that episode. So again, that is available here on the YouTube channel and wherever fine podcasts are given away for free. Uh, that's the final episode of the Summer Series 2023. Uh, so I really enjoyed doing the Summer Series this year. 
Uh, it was fun to, to bring people onto the show and give everybody a, a chance to ask me a question. Uh, but now starting in September, uh, we go back to our regularly scheduled interviews. Uh, and, you know, I, I mentioned earlier, I've got some good stuff coming up. Celia is going to be on the show. Everett Oliver. Uh, Hunter Peterson is going to be talking about YouTube. Christina Malizia. I'm uh, going to be doing an interview with her that's going to run in October. Uh, we're going to talk about animation and, and probably get into gaming a little bit. Christina has been so incredibly successful in her career. I'm sure there's some things that we can learn from her. So some good stuff uh, coming to the podcast. What questions can I answer for you? What do you guys want to know? What can I help you with on the business and marketing side of voiceover? If you've got questions, I can stick around for a little while longer and, and answer some of those questions. Um, if you're all tapped out, have answered all of your questions for the day, um, I'll go back into the studio and I will do some do some recording and I've got some work that I've got to get done, but I'm happy to stick around for a little while longer. If there's questions that I can answer for you, don't be shy. Uh, it's free advice Friday. Uh, type it into the comments, uh, put a cue beside it, and uh, I will certainly do my best to answer as many questions as I can as they, they pop up on my screen. How has working out healthier lifestyle consistently helped your biz? Uh, I, am, I do not work out. Uh, I have a dad bod. I walk a lot. Um, I try to walk every day. Um, and, and I don't just do that specifically for physical health. Uh, I do that because my office is in the basement. Um, I don't have a window and sometimes I just need sunlight. Uh, and, and sometimes I need a break. Um, honestly going out for walks, one of two things will happen for me when I go on a walk. Either I go out with the intention of listening to a podcast or I go out with the intention of doing absolutely nothing and just being in peace and quiet, uh, which is one of the ways that I generate a lot of my ideas. Um, so I make a point of walking to the post office every day, right? It's a, you know, for me, it's a 30 minute round trip, give or take to, to walk to the post office and back. Uh, and so, you know, as long as the weather's half decent, that's, that's one of the things that I do. So, um, I mean, yes, obviously there are, are health benefits to that. Um, there are definitely mental health benefits to that, uh, but there are also business and creative benefits uh, to that. But I am not a gym guy. Um, I would I would not survive in the gym. I do think that physical conditioning can certainly play a role when you're in the booth uh, when it comes to your breathing, your lung capacity, your your stamina. Um, and that can be, uh, you know, it sounds ridiculous, right? If you're going in, you're recording a 30 second commercial, big deal. Okay. But go in and record a, a 5,000 word e-learning script. Um, you know, sign up to do a, a 50,000 word audio book or sign up for a, a character that requires an incredible amount of physicality just to be able to get into that character and be able to act out that character. And so your, your physical stamina and your conditioning can certainly uh, be a factor, right? If, if you don't have the, the lung capacity and the stamina and you're heavy breathing, uh, you know, when you're getting tired or you're getting worn out, it's going to make for a lot more editing. Uh, isotope doesn't fix all of it. Trust me, I've tried. Uh, so, uh, you know, I, I do think in that regard, there's, there's certainly some value, but I definitely think part of it is, is for me anyway, part of it is men mental health, uh, getting a break, getting out of the booth, getting into the sunshine, uh, getting some fresh air, uh, and, and, you know, change the scenery. I, I talk all the time about the value of changing the scene, uh, and, and how that can have an impact on your, uh, you know, uh, on your creativity, your productivity, getting the ideas flowing. And so I, I definitely think there's, there's some value there. What else do you guys want to talk about? What else is going on? What else is happening? What's, what's going on out there? Anything that I can help you with? Any other questions that you've got? Don't be shy. I mean, I know there's a few of you still hanging out and watching. Don't be a lurker. Type a question. Let me answer it for you. I'm happy to do it. That's why I do this. Try to do this every week. Uh, speaking of which, let me take a look at my schedule while we're sitting here. I do have free advice Friday on the calendar for next week. And I do think that I will be able to do free advice Friday next week. So we should be here September 8th, uh, same bat time, same bat channel. Tell all your friends. Iris says, what VO related sales will you be looking out for during Labor Day weekend? If any, um, I have all the VO gear that I need right now, but I am definitely got my eye on some live streaming stuff. Um, there, there's some more stuff that I would like to get. 
particularly for the podcast, uh, in order to pr improve the podcast. Um, I, I, obviously the podcast has been a, a vid, an audio podcast from the very beginning. That's what a podcast is, but more and more, I am starting to play around with video. And so if you go back, uh, all the summer series episodes were video. Uh, and so that's, I've recorded video in the past, but I have not always used the video. Um, but if you go back through the, the summer series episodes on the YouTube channel, you'll see that they are all video. Uh, the video, like the video's there. It's you, you know, me and the guest on camera, whatever. Uh, and so I'm starting to to play around with the video version of the podcast a little bit more. And, and there are a few toys that I would like to get in order to improve the video version of the podcast. My, my problem is I've spent at this point, I've probably spent about $3,000 on stuff for live streaming. And, you know, I'm, I'm having a hard time justifying it to my wife, who's like, really? Like, you know, right now there's 14 people on this live stream, which, hey, I love it. I'll, I'll hang out if there's only three of you. Uh, you know, some weeks there's 50 or 60. You know, I've had 100 people show up before, but, you know, it's not uncommon for there to be, you know, 20 people here. And it's like, is it really worth spending thousands of dollars for, you know, if 20 people are showing up for your live stream? Well, you know, I want to deliver good stuff. I want to deliver good quality. So uh, I'm not particularly on the lookout for any voiceover related stuff because I think I'm pretty set there. Uh, but there might be some video things that I might want to buy. Uncle Roy says, if Isotope RX-10 standard goes on sale, keep an eye out for that. I didn't believe it until I experienced it for myself. I had seven. I had RX-7. And I was told that the D-clicker on RX-10 was a lot faster. Let me tell you, it is a lot stinking faster. Now, that may not be an issue if you are primarily voicing short form content, you know, short corporate videos, short explainers, short commercials. But as soon as you start recording long form e-learning or you're editing hour long podcast episodes, holy mackerel, the D clicker in RX 10 is so much faster and it was absolutely worth the upgrade. Mr. McFadden says, on initial emails, I've started adding the line, if you don't use professional voiceover at your firm, please reply with the subject line, no thanks, and I won't trouble you again, your thoughts. Hey, I mean, there's nothing wrong with that, right? Giving them an opportunity to opt out, that saves them from getting emails that they don't need. That saves you from keeping up with people who there's no reason for you to keep up with. And so I think... Lots of times we're afraid to put an opt out because we assume that, you know, if people opt out, then, you know, we're losing out on opportunities. But the reality is if they're opting out, there probably wasn't an opportunity there to begin with. And so I've only got so many hours in the day. I've only got the capacity to send so many emails. I don't want to send emails. I don't want to continue to send emails to somebody who's never going to hire me anyway. And so for, for that reason, I, I think that there's definitely value in, in putting an opt out like that. Guy says, as a newbie, ready to get Uncle Roy to bless my booth, what's next? Find a coach, start marketing? Uh, well, I mean, once your booth is blessed, at least you know that you, uh, you've you got the goods as far as being able to record. Um, coaching is obviously essential. Um, you've you've got to you've got to have the ability to deliver right. Having good sound is one part of the puzzle. It's a very important part of the puzzle. It's a it's a piece that is often overlooked, but next to having the good sound is the ability to deliver the good read. And so I would say that coaching is definitely going to be potentially part of that. If you haven't done it yet, guy, then yes, coaching is the next step. Um, obviously, you've got to have your demos, you've got to have your website up and running. Once you've got all of those things in place, um, you've got the studio is approved, you know, Uncle Roy's given it the thumbs up. Uh, you've got professional demos that you are ready to market with. You've got them on a good looking website that you're ready to drive traffic to, uh, and you have the ability to deliver the performance that you need to be able to deliver. Then you are ready to start marketing. Absolutely. And uncle Roy is a great coach. I coached with uncle Roy. He was my first coach. So 
that might be a conversation worth having with him uh, while he's blessing your studio, which good luck. I hope that your studio gets blessed. I remember the first time that my studio got the thumbs up. It was, it was good. It felt good. It's nice to know. That's one thing. When, once you've got that, it's nice to know that you don't have to wonder about it anymore, right? Like there was a part of me that it, prior to having that, I was always questioning, you know, is it is it good enough? Is my sound a factor? It's nice to be able to just eliminate that that concern. It's it's nice to be able to know, no, nope, it's not a factor anymore. Now, if this was my voiceover space, I know that my sound would be a factor. I've got acoustic panels. I just haven't got them put up yet. I got to figure out where I want to put them. You know, and I'm doing the best that I can. I, I don't want to do free advice Friday in my booth, though. It's way too cramped in there uh, for, for doing a live stream for an hour and, you know, being comfortable. It's hard enough sometimes doing a podcast interview in there for an hour and being comfortable. When I built it, I built it for recording voiceover. I did not build it with the thought that I would ever need to be using it for uh, video or doing video podcasts or, or anything of that nature. Uh, you know, future proof your booths, guys future proof your booth don't just think about what you're going to be doing it in a year from now think about what you're going to be doing it at five years from now apparently i didn't do that again if you've got a question that you would like to ask and get answered don't be shy type it into the comments put a cue beside it i'm keeping an eye out i'm certainly happy to answer a few more questions hang out for a little bit longer uh Always enjoy being here with you guys. Always enjoy uh, having the opportunity to answer your questions. Guerrero says, following up, will a dynamic mic like the SM7B with a cloud lifter be better than a condenser in a blanket booth? Looking to filter out that noise that's out of my control, the neighbors. Uh, Uncle Roy, I'm going to let you take that question because I, I do not know the answer to that question. Um, would the SM7B with a cloud lifter be better uh, when you've got outside noise factors that you can't control. I mean, I will tell you straight up, that's one of the reasons why I recorded. That's one of the reasons why I got a, a 416, uh, because the 416 was so much more forgiving of the space that I was in. Um, when I was first, the first few years that I was working full time, I didn't have a booth. I had a spare bedroom and I did the best that I could in that spare bedroom, you know, put in some furniture, laid down some carpet put up a bunch of acoustic panels on the wall, put a couple of cloud panels on the ceiling above me and, and did my best to control the sound in the space as much as possible. Uh, but that was, uh, that was why I got the 416. I, I, and I asked Uncle Roy straight up, I'm like, look, I want one mic that I can record whether I'm at home or I'm at on the road and I need it to be forgiving of the space that I'm in. And that's where we settled on the 416, which I have recorded with that microphone in my studio I have recorded with that microphone in hotel rooms. I have recorded with that microphone in a car. Uh, I've, I've done all kinds of stuff, uh, which, which is, you know, speaks to volumes to the microphone. Uncle Roy says, almost no way to kill outside noise without a real booth. And you know what? I'll tell you right now, even that's not a guarantee. Um, I'm in the basement. Uh, I built my booth, double uh, thick walls, double insulation, you know, did everything that I could possibly do to uh, to limit the noise and limit vibration and, and all of that sort of stuff. Um, and yet last week, there was a crew across the street repaving a parking lot. I live across the street from an elementary school. There was a, a crew over there repaving the parking lot. And every day that they were working, I could not record because the vibrations from them tearing up concrete laying down or tearing up asphalt, laying down new asphalt, whatever. It literally shook our entire basement. Now, if I was upstairs, you would not even know that there was anything going on. But in the basement, the whole entire basement was shaking. And so for like a week, I couldn't do anything, which was incredibly frustrating. Uh, so, you know, sometimes even having a booth isn't a complete guarantee, but certainly uh, sets you up in a, in a better position than not having after a couple of weeks off the socials due to life getting in the way, what's the best way to get back into the swing of LinkedIn? Uh, post. Just go. Just go on LinkedIn. Don't overthink it. Nobody's even going to know that you were away for a couple of weeks. Like, honestly, nobody's even going to notice. Um, the easiest way, I think, and this can go for any of the social media uh, channels, but uh, with LinkedIn, I would say put a 15-minute time block in your calendar every day, Monday to Friday, Put a time block in there. Whatever time it is that works for you, 9.45 a.m. to 10 a.m., whatever. 
Put a 15 minute time block in your calendar. And during that time block, go on LinkedIn, leave a couple comments, send a couple connection requests, share a piece of content if you have a piece of content to share. 15 minutes and then you're off and you're on to the next thing. I think it's important to set the, I, th I think it's important to put it in the calendar because by putting it in the, the calendar, it creates a time block which can build a habit. I think that it's important to have a time limit on it because otherwise with social media, it's really easy to go on and, and I meant to be there for 10 minutes and I ended up being there for an hour, right? Uh, and so I think those are the types of things that you use to build habit. But yeah, just get back on the platform and just start engaging. And I think this is something that uh, I, Celia and I talked about in our, our interview together. Uh, we talked a little bit about social media strategy and, and I think Sometimes we put so much effort on the content creation side of social media that we forget about the engagement side of social media. And so, yes, creating content is good. Yes, creating content should be part of your strategy, but that shouldn't be the only thing that you're thinking about. It is equally as important, if not more important, particularly on a platform like LinkedIn, to make sure that you are spending time each day engaging. And engaging doesn't just mean giving a thumbs up. Engaging means leaving a comment. Anton says, for a new VO artist, what top tips do you have for attending Mavo 2023? Uh, first and foremost, you're going to love it. I, I, I love what Val is doing with Mavo. I'm excited to be a part of Mavo. Uh, I always have fun there. Uh, there's great seafood restaurants, by the way. Um, I mean, my, my top tips for conferences are kind of the same regardless of the conference that you go to. I think number one, go with a plan. There's going to be a lot of sessions and it's gonna be really easy to feel FOMO because you're looking at all the sessions that are happening, realizing that you can't possibly be at all of the sessions that are happening because multiple sessions happening at the same time, et cetera, right? And so... The easiest way to avoid that FOMO is to go in with a plan. I am going to Mavo to learn X. I am going to Mavo to study with X. I am going to Mavo to focus on X genre, whatever it is. But if you have a plan, a clear learning objective for what you want to accomplish there, then you can build a schedule around that objective and then it doesn't matter if you're missing some of those other sessions because you're accomplishing the thing that you went there to accomplish. So I think that's one thing that's really important. I think it's really important that you have fun and that you meet people and that you go there understanding that this is not a place that you're going to go to find voiceover work. This is, going, this is a place that you are going to go to find a community, a community who can support you, a community who can in, uh, encourage you, a community that you can learn from. And so going with the intention of just meeting people and, you know, having coffee or sitting down with somebody at the bar or picking a different table at lunch or whatever, I think that's really important. Um, and then, of course, old dad in me, I always get made fun of for this, but it doesn't make it any less true. These conferences, whatever one you're going to, they're not an inexpensive investment. By the time you pay for your conference ticket, you pay for your hotel, you pay for whatever travel arrangements, you know, driving, airplanes, trains, submarines, however you're getting there, it's not an inexpensive investment. And so you want to maximize that investment by actually going to bed on time, not getting completely drunk out of your brain every night at the bar, and then getting up in the morning and actually going to the sessions. And I say this and people make fun of me because again, old dad, but I have had so many conversations with voice actors who have so much regret because they've gone to a conference, they've stayed in the bar until it shut down. And then they went back and you know hung out in the room until three or four o'clock in the morning. And then they slept until noon and they missed a session or missed a couple of sessions or they were hung over the next day and felt terrible or whatever. Why would you spend a thousand or two thousand or four thousand dollars to go to a conference and then miss out on all of the opportunities that that conference gives you because you went a little too social? And so that would be uh, tip number three, I think. Uh, but definitely, you you're you're gonna have fun there, uh, and you're and you're gonna learn things there because Val has done 
a really great job of putting together a really great conference with a lot of really cool speakers talking about a lot of really cool stuff. And I'm not just saying that because I get to be there. I'm, I'm saying that because it's true. Uh, so looking forward to seeing you and Mavo, Anton. Ira says, Celia is right in my backyard. I need to connect with her once my demos are redone. Roy, I'll need to connect with you for an update soon. Celia is amazing. Uh, we had a really fun time doing the interview. You know, I talk all the time about the uh, Voice Over Achiever book, which is the book that Celia wrote. Uh, you know, grab it from Amazon or, or wherever. Uh, absolutely worth the read. Um, I have, I read it uh, recently, and which is crazy because it's the book has actually been out for a while. It's been out for a few years, and I've owned it for a few years. I just never actually got the opportunity to sit down and read it. And so when I finally made the in intentional decision to sit down and read it, uh, not that long ago, I ended up reading the whole entire book in a night because it was so good. And then I was like, oh my goodness, I like, I built an entire podcast interview out of questions that came, oops, I hit the wrong button, uh, out of questions that came from me wanting to ask Celia, um, you know, from what came up from reading the book. Uh, I just put it in the in the chat there, guys, if you want to take a look at it. Voice over achiever, brand your VO career, change your life. Um, great book. Great book. All right, let's see. Brad says, do you have some suggestions to offer for choosing a reputable coach? Techniques for sifting the wheat from the chaff when it comes to coaches. References, 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 references. And when you get the references, actually check with the references. So if you go to J. Michael's website, as an example, you can see all of the demos that J. Michael has produced, and you can see all of the talent that J. Michael has worked with. And that is really a form of a testimonial, right? Uh, if you go to Anne Gangusa's website, I'm pretty sure she's got a portfolio as well. Um, you know, you can see coaches and producers who have won awards or been nominated for awards and, and those sorts of things speak. Um, but I do think that it's important to ask for some references. And I do think that it's important to follow up with some references. And I think the other thing that you can do is chances are you've got people in the industry that you know and trust. Ask those people, the people that have come before you. I mean, I make suggestions all the time for coaches and demo producers. I am not a performance coach. I am not a demo producer. I have no intentions of being a performance coach. I have no intentions of being a demo producer. I don't get kickbacks from the people that I refer. I refer them because I've worked with them. I refer them because I know them. I refer them because I trust them. I refer them because they're good. If you don't ever hear me talking about a particular coach, chances are there's a reason why I'm not talking about a particular coach because it may be somebody that I don't endorse or somebody that I would not refer to. But certainly don't be afraid to ask people that you know in the industry uh, to see who they suggest. I think to a degree... You can look at reputable organizations like Gravy for the Brain, like Anganguza's VO Peeps, um, Global Voice Acting Academy. You can even look at, at some of the conferences. Look at VO Atlanta. Uh, look at Mavo. Who are the people that are speaking at these events? Who are the people that are teaching, coaching, mentoring at these events? Because those events are all, uh, th those events and organizations are all reputable. And so I think that they bring in trusted, reputable people. And that doesn't mean that that's the exclusive list, but it can certainly be another way of, of trying to figure out who's good and who you can trust. Uh, and, and, you know, it, when, when all else fails, Brad, send me an email and tell me what you're looking to coach in. And I can certainly make some references and recommendations for you as well all right guys i gotta wrap this one up but thank you so much for hanging out as always it's it's fun to do these free advice fridays i look forward to it uh if all goes well i will be back with you again next friday 
Uh, now that we're back into the fall, summer vacation's over, kids are going back to school. Uh, hopefully I can start reaching out to some people and getting some guests to come on the show and, and bring some uh, guest coaches, guest speakers, guest mentors, whatever, people that you would like to ask questions of. By the way, that reminds me, um, if there are people that you would like to see on Free Advice Friday, uh, don't be afraid to send me an email and let me know. Uh, I can't promise that I can get everyone that, that you guys are interested in, but I can certainly reach out and, and ask some people. Uh, so if there's particular people that you think, man, I would love to have them on and, and be able to ask them questions, uh, then, you know, let me know and I'll see if I can get them on and you can have the opportunity to ask them questions. Uh, that's it for now, though. Thank you so much for hanging out. As always, I appreciate it. Make sure you check out the new episode of the podcast at uh, vopreneur.com or wherever fine podcasts are given away for free. And remember, you can watch the video version of it right here on the YouTube channel if you would like as well. Whatever you decide to do this weekend, have fun, stay safe, and as always, go find some leads.